Hi, thank you all for joining our online event, Game City Impulse Diversity Management in the Games Industry. My name is Johannes Klockenring. I work for the initiative Game City Hamburg. As Game City Hamburg, our aim is to support, promote, and connect the games industry here in Hamburg, Germany. Tonight's event is part of our series, Game City Impulse, in which we approach the topic of equality, diversity, and inclusion from different perspectives with regard to games, the games industry, and gaming culture. We started this series because we not only support the making of games, but we also like playing them. And like many of you too, maybe, we feel that while gamers around the globe are diverse in so many ways, be it age, gender, ability, ethnic or socioeconomic background, the communities around games and oftentimes the teams may not always reflect this diversity. With the Game City Impulse events, we want to raise awareness and contribute to the discourse around diversity in games and the industry, share insights and provide food for thought. Tonight, we want to discuss what games companies can actually do to make the industry a welcoming and safe place for everyone, fostering diversity, equality and inclusion through diversity management. We're very happy to have two industry professionals on our panel tonight and are looking forward to an insightful discussion. Unfortunately, our third announced speaker, Rod from Deep Server Fishlet, couldn't make it tonight. He was sick and uh, get well soon, Rod. But um, we will have a very interesting discussion nevertheless. Um, before we start, I will give a really quick overview of our plan for the evening. So first up, um, we will have a short round of introduction with everyone. Then Trinidad Termida from Niantic will provide us with a keynote on a method they employ at Niantic. And after that, we will start our discussion. Um, by the way, you can always ask your own questions and give us your thoughts at any time through our live chats on our website and via YouTube. And uh, we will bring up all your questions at the end of the discussion. Uh, maybe we won't make it through all of them, but through most of them, hopefully. And now I will gladly hand over the moderation to our discussion host and games journalist, researcher and developer, Nina Kiel. Hello. So I'm Nina Kiel, my pronouns are they, them, and as Johannes already said, I'm a freelance game developer, journalist and researcher, and most of my work actually focuses on diversity in games and the industry, so it's a real treat to be able to host this panel, and I'm looking forward to learning a couple of things from our panelists, and speaking of which, they should introduce themselves as well, and maybe we could start with Trinidad. Thank you, Nina. Hi, everybody. My name is Trinidad Hermida. I'm the head of diversity and inclusion at Niantic, and I'm honored to be here. I'm really passionate about changing policies, impacting people and changing the game. Thank you, Nina. Thank you so much. And Maurice. Hi, everyone. My name is Maurice. Um, I'm the co-founder and game director at Tiny Roar. Uh, we're a 17 people big company uh, here from Hamburg. and I actually present the side that is struggling to maintain like or like hire enough diverse people into my studio and like I will try to figure out how we can change this and like I think we will find some solutions where everyone can help improve the state of the industry. Thank you so much. So we have two very different and very important perspectives. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion. But first, as Johannes already mentioned, we'll have a short keynote from Trinidad introducing the topic and maybe gives, giving some food for thought we can use later. So without further ado, Trinidad, it's your stage. Thank you, Nina. I'm going to share my screen. So. Hi, everybody. It's Trinidad again. You just got introduced to me. Uh, my purpose here today is to give you not only food for thought, but food for action. And I'm not sure if you can see my notifications and I, I don't know how to turn that off, <laughs> but hopefully you can't see this. Um, and the topic today is head, heart, hand, the art to impacting policies and people. And so I'm just gonna go in a little bit into who I am. You already know I'm passionate about people impact and my fun little quote that i love talking about is if we can tap into everyone's genius we can change the game and that's all puns intended and the reason why i like to say that is because we all have a genius within us and if we're not able to tap into that in our workplaces or in our communities 
we're not really fully getting the the full totality of who we are and being able to use that to change um, our communities and impact them. Next. Fun fact. We all talk about insanity. I do a lot, at least I do. And I love this quote by Albert Einstein. Einstein. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Now, not to be super casual, but I've been in this DNI game for a while. And I love using this quote because if we're using the same tools and best practices and methods that we were using 10 years ago that are not really impacting culture and impacting people, then we are literally insane by this definition. And so today I'm going to talk to you about a method that I took from education and tweaked it a little bit so that we can think differently about how we go from a thought to actually action, like a thought to doing something. Uh, and some of my opinions are, you know, are my own. So let me just put that out there. If you don't like them, you can always you know, harass me on LinkedIn or Twitter and we can talk about it. Um, I love having healthy discussions and, and I'm also not here to um, point fingers at anybody. And one thing about pointing a finger, if you point a finger, there's always one pointing back at you. And so I'm always looking at how can I improve and, and grow in my relationship to my own ideas. So I'm gonna go to the next slide. Our challenge. Our challenge today is that we have difficulties building an inclusive culture. Can anybody raise their hand and say they have difficulties? I'm Maurice, I'm looking for you to raise your hand. And I'm like, <laughs> if we, can, we, we all have difficulties and I'm not pointing the finger at Maurice. Maurice and I have talked before this moment, so it's definitely um, a fun time right here. But diversity and inclusion and belonging and equity has become a bur buzzword with no true impact. We see a lot of companies that are, are excited. They're like, well, I'm gonna hire a diversity and inclusion program manager and they're going to just change the whole scope of my whole company or you see companies that are like we're just going to hire more diverse talent and it's just going to just magically change the scope of our games and how we how we produce games how the games have the different um different backgrounds and and how we're going to even think about our our teams and i'm just like okay it's one thing to say it performatively it's another thing to do it and so in order to do it, we have to think differently about how our processes are with internally, how our policies are, and are people really set up for success coming into our companies? That's a food for thought. And I'm not trying to rush through this. I just want to have some time to really just dive into the, the other part. And da -da, there we go. I call this the head heart hand method, and I call it a path to impact. I can call it a lot of different things, path to action, path to impact, path to inclusion. I mean, there's just a lot of different ways to manifest these three things. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you a couple of questions and I'm gonna start to explain them. Head, I know y'all were thinking, where's she going with this head, heart, hand thing? Head, how data is an activator, not an overall solution to all problems. And I'll dig deep into that. Heart, how touching experiences move us past the temptation to engage in performative action. And then hand, how your action seals the deal. External actions seal internal change. Okay, let's start with head. And I'm gonna go back, I don't, I don't know if I can go backwards. There we go, head. So a lot of times when you think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, people automatically want to run to data. And what I mean by that is you can take a rock and throw it at the internet and you can find article after article, I'm talking from Harvard Business Review to some of these prominent like New York Times around why diversity, equity, inclusion is a business imperative. What I mean by business imperative is that if you have a diverse, a balanced, and I love saying balanced workforce with people from all different marginalized genders and, and ethnicities, you are gonna have a higher margin of, of, of success, period. So let's take this rock and let's throw it at the internet. How many of us wanna know about the data first? Whenever there's a problem that comes to you, you're like, well, show me the data. And I understand the logic behind that. I understand why we do that frequently, but I also think that 
it doesn't stop there. Data gives us the mode to action. Data gives us the information that's needed to sometimes, and we think, get people to move to the next step. Here, I'm showing you the data. I'm showing you that this is a business imperative. I'm showing you what it looks like internally. I'm showing you that this is what our communities who play our games look like. This is what the communities who, um, who enjoy this product look like. And this is what we look like internally. But then sometimes we get stuck there. We're like, all right, great, now what? And in order for the data to really actualize, we have to think about how do we take this data and make it act like a, like a physical thing? How do we take this data and create something that can actually counteract that data? Data is something that we're like, boom, we know where the, the people who play our games are 50% women and 30% underrepresented minority. If we want to make sure that our products represent that community, we need to internally reflect that. Right? Simple as that, right? <laughs> now what? I'm here to tell you that a lot of times companies, leaders want the data, but they don't understand that in order for the data to actualize in a formative way, in a program, in an opportunity, in an idea, we have to have the data go from our head to our heart. Dun, 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 dun. This is where the heart comes in. Data stuck in our head is not going to help us impact lives. Data stuck where in that boardroom or in that leadership meeting is not going to actualize into something that we actually feel we need to move into the next arena. My, my way of thinking is very countercultural, y'all. And a lot of times when I'm dealing with engineers and when I'm dealing with people who are very analytical and type A, they go, okay, now what? Like, you know, I need, I got the data, now what, what happens? And this is where it's, it's more relative. And because it's more relative, it's uncomfortable. Because it's more relative, you have to be vulnerable. Because it's more relative, you have to be willing to fail. And so, the path to impact with the heart is, I say, what's the, the, te the, the brain to the heart is like a 12 inch like journey. It's not a very long journey, but it can take a lifetime if you're not willing to be vulnerable, not willing to fail, not willing to try something that's never been done before. There's a lot of best practices out there in the world. And Quite frankly, I'm gonna make a statement that might be very bold. A lot of these best practices are low-hanging fruit. And what I mean by that is they're quick wins. They're, they're things that, that show people, okay, we're on this path, but it's not changing policies. It's creating a, a social group where people can go and feel, feel safe. Besides that, we need to change policies if we really wanna see our culture change and reflect the communities that we serve. So how do we get to the heart from the head? I have a, a really interesting idea here. In order to get from the heart to the head, there has to be an experience. There has to be a, a time, a place, a moment where that data becomes reality. That data touches your heart where it's like, wow, that can impact my community. That can impact my child. That can impact the person who's my best friend who lives down the street. That can impact the barista that I see every day when I go to get my coffee. That's where the data becomes alive. The data starts to have a heartbeat. The data starts to release that, that feeling. And I know this is not, I know this is not like super popular, but that those feelings that we have, that draw those feelings draw us to action. When you have someone in your life that you can say, I see how my actions, my thought processes are gonna in inherently hinder their future. Let's just pause there. There are people in your life who you love, who you enjoy. And if today you knew that your action, your decision-making is gonna hinder their future, would you make that decision? 
regardless of data? Would you make that decision? Let's just sit with that. I have an example of an experience that, and I'm not going to name names because, you know, everybody is, <laughs> everybody is great. Um, I invited a senior leader to an event in the inner city to, to solidify a partnership that I wanted to make, right? There's one thing to give all the data as to why this partnership is imperative. It's giving back to the community. We see the benefits of this. It's not only that, it's a great opportunity for our leaders internally to be mentors, all of that. I had all the data as to why it was important to do this, but they needed to see it in action. And so I invited this leader and this leader came to an event where youth from the ages of, from middle school to high school were trained on how to develop a game. So they spent their summers coming into classes and learning from inception this thought, this idea, how to actually get it on a platform and playable for people. Literally, y'all, we went into an esports arena. There's music playing. There's people from all different backgrounds. We're in, we're in the hood. We're in the inner city of, of East Oakland. And you see lined up around the, the, the seats, you see these, these TVs with consoles, and you see these youth standing next to it, waiting for you to come by and play their game, waiting for you to see what they did for the last couple of summers. And the music, the energy is right. Everybody's smiling, everybody's happy. And you see my leader just going game by game by game by game by game. And I said, hey, all I ask you to do today is give them feedback. They don't know who you are. They don't know what role you play. Just give them that little piece of feedback that could be priceless and encourage them. And game by game, you see, you see him going around, you see him going around. Do you know that at the end of that experience, I didn't talk to him for a couple weeks, but when he came back to me, he was like, I want to sponsor them. I want all of our leaders to go and figure out how they can be mentors. I wanna see how we can purposely, intentionally change the game, empower this generation that's coming up behind us. And I'm telling you right now, there's not enough data, there's not enough um, conversations and presentations that I could have given that ha could have shifted from the data to the heart. It was that experience. And I know we're living in a world with post, well, oh God willing, we're still in the pandemic, but like, just, we're living in a world where these experiences, we, we're kind of limited. We feel like, oh, we can't do in-person experiences or we can't, how am I gonna get someone to, to come from their, their head to their heart? Y'all, we make games. We make games. Do you know that games are an actualization of where we're getting people into a game where they're, they're leaving their current experience? They're diving into a world that we created. Okay, I'll pause there because I'm getting into my conclusion. And I don't even, I don't even know how, many, how much time do I have? Am I, am I too late? Can you give, like show me a number of fingers? Um, okay. <laughs> uh, we make games. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause right there and let you sit there. Okay, what does that mean? All right. Now, hand. I talk about this heart piece because... The heart is when we, are, we feel and we're excited. The heart is where we're like, yes, let's go. But the, if you stop at the heart, you've also stopped too short of the finish line. And what I mean by that is the hand is the actualization. The hand is the action. The hand is when my executive leader came to me and said, we want to do this. We need to support. We need our leaders to go and be mentors. We need to, to do whatever we can. Do they need... Do they need um, access to software? Do they need hardware? Like, what are the things that we can do? That's, that's when the heart said, I need action. So the hand is the active piece. The hand is when we seal the deal. And I love saying, when you go and you, you're going into a meeting and you're making a, um, you're closing the deal, what do you do at the end? You shake hands and you say, congratulations, thank you. And, and I also like to say, the hand is the part where the internal realization becomes an external action, right? 
Right. So I love the hand piece because that's where we get down to the nitty gritty. That's actually one of the hardest parts. You could have a passion in your heart. You can know the data in your head, but a lot of people get stuck at, now what do I do? And this is where I love us to tap into our genius. What you do is not something that you just go on the internet and you Google how to be more diverse in a studio. That's not, where, that's not what you do. What you do is where you tap into your own genius and you ask yourself, what am I the bomb at? What am I super dope at? What is my genius? What am I, am I a connector? Am I a developer? Am I an artist? Am I taking your genius and, and attaching what you do to your genius? Because you already have that. You already have that. I don't need to create that. I don't need to teach you that. It's already in you. I'm going to go to the next slide. And I'm not, I'm not, this is not the end I'll be on. I'm still talking. But I want you all to think about this. When I say tapping into your genius, you have to be innovative. You have to be open. You have to try new things. You have to fast fail. And this statement that I make, it's time to get back to our first love. Why are we in this industry? I promise you we're not in this industry because we hate it. I promise you we're not in this industry because every day we wake up and we're like, Ugh, why am I here? There are several other industries and there's several other jobs that you can be doing right now but you're here because you're passionate about games and creating. We are creators and creators create without fear. I promise if you go back into your head to when you first played a game or when you first drew or when you first sealed your first code, there was something within you like you got goosebumps. There was something within you that just got ignited and you were excited because you did it by faith. You didn't have fear. Fear will always keep us from success. And what I'm saying right now may be scary to some of those people, some of the people who are listening to my voice. I know it's scary. I know that it's like, ooh. I say, but what if I fail? But what if you fly? What if you do something that is going to change the game? What if you do something that's going to impact a whole generation? But what if you fly? What if, I mean, when creators create, and that's anything from a developer to an artist, to an executive, to a leader, there's something within you that gets excited when you start to see things actualize right before. It's almost like you're giving birth to something. Why do we have to separate diversity, equity, and inclusion from the process of creation? Why do we have to go in our brains and try and put it in a different in a different compartment when I'm telling you that it's already in you? Whatever your genius is, whatever it is that you were you're in this earth and you you believe that you're in this earth to do, I promise you if you take that look at that and see what can I do with this? What can I do with with this passion I have? What can I do with this idea I have? Nina is a journalist. Nina writes. Nina uses their gift to create an opportunity for people to learn about this space. Maurice is a founder. Maurice is a creator. Maurice can use his creative mind to think of ways of how do I, in this space, you know, yes, I need this senior role. Okay, I have a board seat. Or like, these are areas that are high hanging fruit that are gonna change the trajectory of how your studio looks, how your studio's perceived because you're taking risky, risky creative leaps. So, I don't think I need to be here very long to let y'all know what my purpose is for y'all today. My purpose is for y'all to go into your quiet place, go into your hearts, go into your brains and say, what genius do I have that I can give back to the communities that need me? Is it just 
a conversation? It might be. Is it connection? It might be. Is it writing an article? It might be. Is it creating a new avatar? It might be. Is it creating a new game? It might be. Is it changing code? It might be. But it's up to you if you're going to be the solution to the problem. It's up to you if you're going to take your precious time and effort and do something for the generations that come after us. It's up to you if you're going to change the game. And on that note, I thank you all for your time. That's my LinkedIn and that's my Twitter. <laughs> but if you want to debate this, my Twitter is this is Trini. If you want to debate this, my LinkedIn is my name is Trinidad Hermita. But I challenge you to instead of debating with me what your genius is, you go inside your heart and you find out if you're truly utilizing your gifts to change this generation and impact this generation. And on that note, thank you. Thank you so much for this very insightful talk. It was very passionate, very motivational, and I'm really looking forward to discussing the topic now with you. Um, and yeah, maybe we can dive into these concepts later. You can talk about them more in detail uh, later because that was just an overview and I think it's really fascinating. But before we really delve into the topic, I'd like to take a step back and ask a very basic question opening the panel. And that's, what is diversity and how do you define it in the context of business and hiring practices? Because I think many people don't know that. So let's get everybody on the same page and answer that question if you like. So diversity, I'll speak first. Um, diversity is, I use the term diversity uh, lightly. Uh, I believe diversity is really marginalized genders, a place where mar marginalized genders and ethnicities can have a seat at the table that all people do. And I and what I mean is diversity is balance. And, and a lot of people, I mean, we all know in life there's really like no balance, but diversity is a place where there's balanced views, balanced ideas, balanced um, opportunities. There's a there's no gaps. So for me, that's what diversity is. Maurice, would you like to add something? Yeah, like looking at our company name when we like, went into the thought process of how should we name our company, um, we always wanted to have like this like listen to the uh, smallest voice or like like like. Not, not the one who's like make is making the biggest noise so like from the studio where i worked before like what we saw there was was a lot of like elbow society as we say it in german i don't know if it translates well in, into english but um we wanted to turn it around because like there's always like this one best argument but like to find this best argument you need actually to bring as many different perspectives to the table to pinpoint it and this is how game development works like you ask your community you ask the team you look at the data and um, why shouldn't this be like something that works on every level and this also means hiring and trying to bring people into your team that add something to the table instead of just getting the same people over and everyone is saying yeah it's great what we're doing and you're doing great let's continue the same road and um yeah so diversifying viewpoints yeah that perfectly leads over to my next question actually and Trinidad you already mentioned that in your talk kind of which is why is promoting diversity important from from a business point of view we all I think we all agree that diversity is important in general from a moral standpoint but what about business how can businesses profit from that Trinidad you said that uh, diversity leads to higher margin of success how how uh, what exactly is the connection between diversity and success when you have balanced teams you catch things before they even go out when you have balanced teams you're able to have a different viewpoints in the room that can also increase the probability of your product being more equitable when you have balanced teams you're able to challenge each other so you're not flat you're not flat in the sense that you're only thinking about something in one regard. So I truly believe that 
diverse diversity helps the bottom line of the business because you're creating better products. You're creating better teams that are able to challenge each other and elevate each other. And you're also, you're not just saying, oh, everybody, and I'm, I'm making a blanket statement, but everybody's coming from MIT so that it's the top of the line, so we got the best team ever. No, I truly believe, and this is something that I, 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 I exec, exemplify in my mentor relationships, I learn from my mentees. I learn from, from everybody. So being able to have a seat at the table when you may not have the same degrees or the same access or the same experience, it's helpful to build in those equity gaps and come with a more larger breadth of air when you're coming to products. So product development is going to be better, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So though some people might, might argue, well, the games industry has been around for a long time and it has been very homogenous, but still we sold those games, right? Everything is fine. We made that money. So why should we diversify our teams? What would you respond to that? I would respond to that with what we see happening in the communities right now with a lot of game companies being called out because we're, we're, it's, a, it's a smoke and mirror. Like, and, and also, it's nice to think that a group of men can create a game for women and we, and we love it. But I promise you that as a game player myself, we give, as players, we give feedback all the time. And a lot of times it doesn't get reflected or heard within the games. And that's a bigger problem. But yeah, it's successful because we like to play. We want to play. But this generation is now realizing that we have access to development. And now that we know that we can develop, I truly believe that the next couple of generations coming after us, you're going to see a totally different span of opportunities in the game industry and, and products. We're going to see different products, different games that, that actually reflect who we are and what we want to watch and play. Yeah, there's a lot of innovation around now nowadays, and that's probably very important for, for you, Maurice, and your colleagues as an indie studio, right? Because you have to innovate to also be noticed by people. How do you approach this kind of innovation? You already said that there's not that much diversity in your team right now, um, but I'm, I'm sure you also have diverse voices among you, right, in some way or the other. So how do you approach innovation? Sure. Like, um, coming back, actually, to the thing that I mentioned before that we're trying to give everyone a voice. So it's not like us directors deciding which game is going to be made next, but actually what we try to uh, establish is that everyone can take the stage and like the best idea uh, wins. And um, we're talking about games. People get excited about good ideas. It doesn't matter from who they come. It's more important like how they're presented. And then we go back to like, ah, oh, okay, so now, um, I'm going to contradict myself, like someone will come up with a completely new idea, like in a new environment uh, with different people than when he stays with the same group over and over. And if we look at the audience and the consumers of games, like uh, a lot of ways how there are like still talks held and whatever, it's still about like this old school game design way, like how people consume games. And this change, like in the last 20 years, I think in so many different ways, and there is no explicit gamer tag that a human wears anymore. Like everyone is gaming now and everyone has an opinion on games. And it's, it's even if you put a product that a prototype into game testing, like don't only go to conventions where there's like gamers, but like bring it to your family. Like what does your aunt say? What does your grandma say? And um, this all brings something back into your whole process, how you think. And I think changing the way how you approach creative processes and how you try to solve this riddle in your head, how you get this magic essence of your project, um, it really helps if you don't hang out only with the people that uh, think the same way as you do. And it helped me a lot, actually. And something maybe to, we will get into this later, um, I see that sometimes this change of heart, I want to say not mind, because this would be too logical, um, takes or is painful because you have grown up to a specific kind of exposure and surroundings and you have this mindset that you of course are right, right? Like you've, you are now in this situation and you build your ideas around this, how this should work. And suddenly someone calls you out, for example, and accepting, that you, I don't want to say screwed up, but like didn't think of it or like weren't thinking broad enough 
um, this is not you failing. Uh, this is you realizing that you made a mistake and maybe you take some time to accept this. And I see a lot of people struggling with this, especially in the creative businesses, especially with creative roles where we're like the same kind of people putting their peers into good position. And um, like, we are all responsible to uh, question ourselves, like not going crazy and not um, that are getting afraid that we can't say anything anymore, but like thinking like, why am I saying this? And why are people people telling me I shouldn't say this instead of like getting offended about this feedback. And yeah, this happens way earlier when you have a diverse group of people instead of just your friends hanging out and having like some bro talk. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, diverse audience really helps too. Um, but what you just mentioned failure, and maybe we can already talk about that because that's a good opportunity to do so. You also mentioned that Trinidad, that failure is a normal part of the process kind of, but it's really scary, right? Because we don't want to fail. We don't want to be called out. How do you deal with that? Because I mean, many people seem to be hesitant to change anything, to change their structures, to change their thinking, because they're too scared to do so. Do you have any advice for those people? I do. I do. So I'm going to use a word that a lot of people like, don't like to use is vulnerability. There's a, there's a person, her name is Brene Brown, and she talks about vulnerability a lot and she's worked with CEOs and companies globally. And she describes it as vulnerability is being able to get into the arena. And because when you get into the arena, and if you think of it, it's like as a game, like I go into the arena, I could win or I could lose, but I got into the arena. Vulnerability is not just standing in the crowd and pointing at the arena and saying, they should do this, they should do this, they should do this, they, from a safe place, right? You, um, you're you barking from safety. You know, like we, um, I have, um, my brother has a dog called Tyson and he's a boxer. And we always used to joke and say, Tyson likes to bark from safety. Like he'll just go to the door and be like, rah, 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 rah. but like the door opens, he ain't going nowhere. You know what I mean? Like, And it's like, how many of us like to bark from safety? How many of us like to give our, opinions but not actually try out these opinions or or put put our money where our mouth is or like actually do it and i do think that fear fear what's the whole purpose of fear fear is to block us fear is to keep us um paralyzed fear is to to stop us from being able to try something that we've never tried before but what is innovation innovation and i see that is this did i pause Sorry. Innovation is where you try new things. Innovation is where you, you say, let's let's tweak this. Innov and the fun fact about it is like, even when you fail, you don't fail totally. And what I mean by that is you have some learnings, key learnings that you can use that are going to help to empower you to make better decisions in the future. Mm -hmm. And so I always like to say, I don't want to throw the baby out at the bathwater. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of times when we have these ideas, you know, like, oh, that just didn't work. No, you take, you pause and you say, but what did work? Is there a way that we can pivot from this? Is there a way that we can learn from this? Is there, um, and then also engage in your community. We are not an island into ourselves. If you're a leader and you have an executive team, or if you're a manager and you have a team, like your team is valuable. A lot of times companies forget that our people are our biggest asset. Mm -hmm. So how are we empowering our people and the genius? We hire them to do something, but sometimes we forget that we're all intersectional. We're all multifaceted. We're not just one thing. Yes, Niantic hired me to be the head of diversity and inclusion, but I also write. I'm also a singer. I'm also a family woman. I'm also someone who loves to travel. I could also talk to you about things like the ocean. I watch National Geographic all the time. You know, like there's just, I'm not just a, a box, a cookie cutter box that you can put me in, you know? And so it's when we start to think people first, and I know that that's sometimes scary because we like to think product first, then people. Guess what? Our people make our products. 
And if we empower our people with the tools, with some autonomy, oof, scary, huh? Letting someone else manage your baby. And this is another thing too, is CEOs, you gotta, you gotta give your baby, you know, you gotta allow your baby to grow in, in the village. It takes a village to raise that baby. If you were able to do it by yourself, you wouldn't have a full blown company. You wouldn't have a full blown studio. You wouldn't have a bunch of executive leaders around you. You know that you're only as good as the community that surrounds you. So I'll pause there. <laughs> so that also kind of means giving people a safe space to fail, right? Because failure can be horrible if you don't have a safety net, right? I mean, failure is a privilege in some way because some people can't fail. They don't have the financial means, for example. So maybe that would be a good way to support people, not just giving them money, giving them advice and making them feel like they have the opportunity to fail, right? I would also say is like a lot of times we'll throw a problem at someone, but we don't set them up for success. So how do you allow someone to fail, but with a mentor, with the right person who's failed before, but has also been successful? Or how do you set up your team for success, but know that they might fail even in that success? Like, so you still have to create the structures around that and the ability to have um, resources. And not all resources are money. You know, some resources time. And I know time is precious, but as a, Do you like have we all ever been in that predicament where it's like you're texting someone back and forth or you're emailing back and forth and you're just like, let's just get on the phone. And when you get on the phone, you realize like, oh, that took five minutes. Like sometimes that five minutes from a CEO or an executive leader could save months of twirling around in time. So time is also a resource. Mm -hmm. So Maurice, you're, you said that you're pretty open to, to critical feedback and perhaps also to failing. How did you reach this point? Because usually people are scared of failing and it was probably a development, right? So how did you reach this point? And what's it like to face failure as an indie developer? Because there's also financial issues attached to that, right? Yeah, so like we at Tiny Roar, like when we started out, we bootstrapped. So there was like no big investment or whatever. So we knew from the start that this could be just one gigantic uh, mistake that we're doing right now. But what we do is like, as and it's not that like everyone that is in this chat room or like the whole world has ever heard of Tiny Roar or whatever. So we're not there like skyrocketing into the sky, but we, I like to say that we are failing forward. So we screw up a lot with each project because we think we are smart now and we are smarter than before. And You just need to get better. So um, this is us as a company, but with my employees, I think a lot of CEOs, especially when the companies grow bigger at some point, and Trinidad already tackled this um, a bit, is you have the responsibility um, to create the space where someone um, isn't afraid. And if you just think about, like some people totally forget everything, how it was to be a child. Like if you... Like some of us lived in households where like failure was also like uh, connected to punishment. And everyone knows nowadays, if you just like look into any um, like child education books or like documentation, that it's not healthy to have this pressure of always being successful, always making the right decision. And um, yeah, failure is actually part of growing. and. What happens if you pressure people to always be perfect, they try to, like, they start to blend you or like they're trying to lie to you. They're not going to be honest. Uh, mistakes are going to be swept under the carpet. And a worst case scenario that we see a lot in bigger companies like abroad from Germany is like people grouping up like as a collective of people that made a lot of mistakes and trying to protect each other against a threat that's not even existent because they're so afraid of being exposed that like this protective shield that they build grows spikes and actually does more damage than good and so support people like even not only while working but in your private life if someone screws up like you always have to say hey it, it, it i think it's important to give the feedback like hey i see there like you could have done this better but it doesn't matter like next step right mm -hmm. you're pretty open about so far having failed to have a diverse team and i'd like to know 
what are the main challenges for you in hiring diverse people for you and also for Trinidad experience or maybe in general what are the main challenges when trying to build up a diverse workforce how, how does one approach this task so um, for our current project just to give you a real life example like we're looking for a level designer we already looked at our team and we're like okay uh, we have people from different cultures represented in our studio, but like gender wise, like we're far behind. So what we did, like we put out a job posting and for us, it was super important, like to get the order right, to have like diverse first, uh, to put this out as a signal and then female and then male in the last, not because like we're against uh, people that uh, say they're male, but less than like, hey, we actually see you and we want to support you and actually we want to give you a chance and you're very important to us and we didn't find a diverse uh like or like a non-male uh, um level designer sadly um and the time was running away while we're, we're interviewing people we actually got just one application it was from an artist and not even a level designer so this was like okay we tried but maybe next time we can do better so when we now have not new positions we still will do it the same way. But what for me was uh, very beautiful to see that actually people reacted to this in a positive light and they messaged or reached out to me and said, hey, I just want to tell you, it felt really good to be seen. And on the one hand, this is what was amazing to me, but at the same time, this was so sad that we're still at a stage where like people feel so unseen and, um, as, as, as some might know, like I worked on like together with Crazy Bunch on like the reboot or semi reboot on Leisure Suit Larry. And this is a game that's very controversial, but from the get go, it was clear, like we will try to bring any, any body shape into this, like a lot of uh, eth ethnicities. And also like we get, give the player the chance to make queer decisions as Leisure Suit Larry, who in the past has been like depicted as this, go like only for female uh, objects in, in the old games. And here it was like, he can be straight, he can be gay, he can be bi. And in the game, there are situations where you actually marry a gay couple in the end with a uh, drag queen doing the honors and whatever. And there again, like just, this was just us like putting some cool ideas down in the text. And this goes back to what Trinidad said in her uh, speech before. Uh, so many people reacted so positive to this, just being part in this game, even this is like not maybe the, especially from the past view, like most inclusive game ever, like the IP. And suddenly they had the feeling like, oh, okay, there were people caring about this and trying to do good. And I think we screwed up in a lot of parts of the game where we tried to do the right thing. But yeah, at least we tried and we need to do better next time. Mm -hmm. So the key takeaway would be you succeeded in some regards, you made people feel seen, which is a very strong bit of success, I think, because many people feel invisible, especially in the game world and feel like no, no games, nobody addresses them. So that's, that's a good thing. But you still didn't manage to find someone for your team. How, how can that be? Trinidad, do you have any idea what could be a problem behind that? What could lead to this kind of failure of not finding someone, even though you're looking specifically for this kind of person? I think our biggest challenge is time. A lot of times when leaders are looking for uh, senior leaders or, or more managerial and up positions, it's because of a, a need. And it's the need is like right now. And to say that there isn't an, uh, a, a female diverse level designer in the world is a farce, right? Like we know that there's, they're out there and we know that they're capable and they're, and they're talented and they're qualified. Now, would it have taken a little bit longer to find that person? Yes. But understanding the business need and the timeline and what we're willing to do and all that kind of stuff. And then also, Let's let's keep it let's keep it a hundred percent honest. Um, Maurice's team is small. Like Maurice doesn't have Maurice is not a, a riot or a Niantic. Um, Maurice is in the beginning stages of building his riot and Niantic. Fingers <laughs> crossed. But um, but at the end of the day, though, when it's important to you early on, like for example, I have friends who are founders, 
And you look at their teams from the inception and they're diverse because it's important to them. And I'm not saying, Maurice, that this is not important to you. I'm not trying to call you out on live TV or whatever. But like, it's like when when you have a leader that is a person from a marginalized gender ethnicity, it's already ingrained in them to think a balanced work, a balanced world, right? Because we're living in we're living in a world where where whatever room I go into, I begin to tilt it over a little bit because most of the rooms that I go into are not balanced. So when I think of creating a strong team, I'm thinking that I want people from all different genders and backgrounds because that's going to make sure that my weaknesses are made known and that I'm able to navigate and build something that's innovative and real and it's something that can last the test of time. So our biggest challenge in most, most including, including um, in the industry that I'm in is time. Like we have, we you know, sometimes you're when you're sourcing or you're looking for talent, it's like, oh, I can't find it. And then you you have to be willing to to know what you don't know and go into rooms and say, hey, I don't know if there's any um, organizations centered around art that for people who are diverse. Like I don't know if there's any organizations um, like women in gaming, women in games, right? That's that's out there. So it's like, how do I, do I go to women in games um, and tap into that network and say, hey, I'm looking for this, can you post it? It might cost some money, it might not. They might just be excited that they have that connection and be like, we'll post the first one for free or whatever. Also, um, are there um, schools that produce within, you know, within the organization? Like also thinking high, higher, level positions we're looking for 25 plus years of like experience sometimes right and it's like okay if you think like that then anybody who's been in like although i know black and brown people who've been in the industry 25 plus years who are dope right like i've, I've met them they're out there i also know that um you're you're limiting your pool and so for me i really do think of like what are other industries outside of gaming that might produce talent that can come into gaming and I just have to give them the gaming boot camp, right? Which I, which is like, I'm gonna teach you for the next couple of months of what the culture is like here, what the environment's like. But if you're a leader in another industry, I think you can pull leaders from all industries into gaming. And I honestly think a lot of these leaders didn't know that gaming was a possibility when they were younger because it might've not even been an opportunity for them because when I grew up, I had to be a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, or a preacher. Like I, I had only those options and I chose the preacher, go figure, right? It was the easiest one. <laughs> so I, I truly believe that like there are opportunities with even cross like um, networking with other industries and saying, okay, you might be in TV and you're doing digital content. You might be um, in, oh man, in, in um, like software engineering or, you know, whatever the other different, there's like so many different opportunities. And so I think sometimes we're so tunnel vision and so siloed that we're not thinking how can we out, outside of the box in ways that we can tap into other industries and steal their talent. Cause everybody's, all we're doing in the game industry is recycling talent. And guess what? Not all of the talent that we're recycling is good. So I just think that we have to pause and really set a, a, a realistic scope of like, hey, if we really want to change the game in our studio, we really want to change the dynamics. We we don't only want to hire college grads and new talent. We also have to think of how are we going to impact senior leaders and senior roles so that when new talent comes in, they see themselves reflected in leadership, which will help you retain talent because they see a, a, a like they see a pathway like, oh, I can be there. I can do that. And then you also have people within leadership who can mentor and be um, be the change that they want to see in that organization. Mm -hmm. And maybe to add on that real quick, like something also is like looking or like shine more spotlights on success stories because coming back to this whole uh, being seen thing, we're still like in, in the point in this industry that like I have the feeling that a lot of people are held back uh, because like of gatekeeping of like feeling, oh, am I good enough for this? And uh, like, uh, to be just super blunt, like cis white males have dominated this industry for quite a long time. And like looking at some of the toxic behavior online, they're still treating like gaming as this sacred island only certain people are allowed on and stuff like this. And I bet that everyone has been in a room with a person like this. 
but maybe depending on our life situation, we were too afraid to just open our mouths and just tell those people to shut up. And this is something that needs to happen way more. Like I've, I'm plenty of guilty. This like in my old company, there were so many situations where I felt like, ah, this is kind of awkward. Like someone should say something, but actually you were the one to make this change. Like you should never wait for someone to step in and suddenly like call the sexist out in a, in, in a meeting. And this is like with all the horror stories happening right now, uh, like I have the feeling like when I talk to female colleagues, they're like, oh, am I in the wrong industry? And maybe I shouldn't stay in games. Like it's horrible. And this is like, I think it's super important how we look at all these horrible things that are out there right now. And it's super important that this happens, but also like shine some hope into that because actually this is a good thing that this is coming out because this is happening all around the world in a way more um, industries, sadly, than only gaming. But the good thing about gaming is due to our backgrounds, we're super connected. We like to engage online and um, we like to talk about our passions and our feelings, actually. Like I've never met more emotional people than in gaming. And I work with people that work for TV and do drama. And um, so talk to each other and help each other out. Like if you see that maybe someone might be put down by someone who has no right to do this, like actually no one has a right to put down anyone. Um, like step up and you will see that if you do this, um, suddenly the whole temperature of the room will change. If it changes to the bad and people will be like, oh man, you're like, you're causing trouble. Then you're hanging out definitely with the wrong people and get the hell out of there because these people don't need you. And they're like, you're way too important and too precious to stay with those because these are bloodsuckers that will profit from what you do with your work and your talent and like leave those guys behind. And, um, yeah, group up, like, it, it's like back in high school, it's uh, like, fight back, and, and if we actually would help each other out all the time, and especially, like, male colleagues, like, all these, uh, sort of, excuse my French, like, idiots that are like, yeah, but he's a nice guy, like, this is always, like, this, this um, explanation why it's okay that someone acts like an ass from time to time, um, yeah, this doesn't work, like, you were part of the problem then, like, if you're saying this, you're actually an ally to the wrong person. And we need to learn this because a lot of people are then like, ah, oh, I'm afraid to say something because I don't want to be a troublemaker in the team or the team mood will be different. Actually, the team mood is already horrible for someone. Why should you, why are you protecting the aggressor? This is something that like, I guess it's in our nature, like as uh, I want to say primitive uh, primates or whatever that like, oh, there's someone loud. I should listen to this guy because he's really loud and he can bang on his chest. But the good thing is we uh, develop tools and social uh, structures that we don't need to listen to these guys anymore. We can survive on our own and we can, especially like in teamwork. Like Yeah, we can, we can do something about that. And I'd like to use this opportunity to talk about responsibility on a management and an individual level. So let's assume you hired diverse team how do you make sure that these people keep feeling comfortable and appreciated in your company because many people don't seem to think about that they just seem to think i need diverse people in my team but you have to make sure that these people keep feeling comfortable and appreciated so they stay with your company right how can you achieve that trinita do you have any um, experience you can share with that about that i i truly believe that you have to have pulse checkpoints like you you can't just like sometimes you get on the train and you just keep going on the train and you don't stop and in order to really truly know how people are doing is to provide feedback real-time feedback because one thing a fun fact is i don't think you really care about me if you don't give me the harsh feedback you don't care about my success if you don't tell me areas that i can improve in and that's out of like when you meet a, re a really good manager, that manager gives you positive feedback and also tells you, hey, this didn't land so well, or this, th you could tweak this, or this is my experience here and you could take it or leave it. But like they, but they give that because guess what? If you've been in the industry for 25 plus years or even 10 years or even three, sometimes three feels like 15, um, you have cheat codes. You have things that you know matter to the industry and how the industry responds to it. 
And if you don't give newer people who've never been in the industry or don't maybe have aunts and uncles who've been successful in the space or have cousins who are doing what you're doing, that these cheat codes matter. So that's what I mean, that's just a little a little nugget for for people who who may have people on their teams who've never been in the industry and you're asking like, why, you know, we all know that we're supposed to skim, submit our code daily. Why are they only submitting it on Friday? Like something as simple as like, hey, hey, we submit our code daily because that's what we do around here. And not assuming that they know that, letting them know submitting your code daily is the standard here. That's a cheat code. If you submit your code daily, whether it's perfect or not, we're going to be excited because that's when we review it or whatever. I'm using that as an example. Um, another idea is, is around how do you know when, like you use surveys, like, and I know nobody likes surveys. They're like, you know, they're, they're outdated, but you should do a survey at least by, by, by yearly where you ask specific questions around engagement, around leadership, around buy-in, around, um, voice and belonging. Do, do they believe in the company still? Do they want to recommend their friends to the company? You know? Do they believe in their manager? Do they believe that leadership hears them? Like, I mean, there's there's all, there's 101 questions that you can ask to find out the temperature of your employees to see if they're still bought in. Then that data can be broken down by gender. That data can be broken down by ethnicity. That data can be joke broken down by tenure. That data can be broken down in so many different ways, which will tell you the story oh, wow, the people who've been here since the beginning are excited. They still love the company. They're excited. And they're all senior, right? The people who are new, who've only been here for three me three months to a year, why are their scores so low? What's going on? You know, And that's when you go back to the people in your company and say, hey, we heard you. What do you mean by this? Not enough finger pointing like I need you to tell us what the problem is so we could, we could point it back at you, but in a, in a regard of, what are some what you know we saw that these were the top the top three and we saw that these were the bottom three these are areas like like voice and, and recognition or or leadership um transparency whatever it is whatever the top three and the bottom three are we hear you what are some ideas that we have and, and how we can improve this and it gives you a checkpoint every six months or quarter however you choose to do it so that you can then show them and, and even respond back and say, we heard you, this is what we're gonna do to address exactly what, what we saw and heard through the, the results. Um, I think a lot of people burn out and with survey fatigue when they don't see the change, when, they don't, when they're doing all these surveys and they don't hear leaders talking about accountability and transparency around these surveys. I do think that it's not one person, you can't point it finger at one manager. And I also love, I want to say to the managers, I, I call the managers the frozen chosen. Uh, I feel for you and I hear, I hear you managers because you're sandwiched in between individual contributors that you're managing and you're trying to help succeed, but you're also sandwiched between director level and above who are making the decisions that you have to implement with no autonomy. So even that's something that I like to call out. There's a lot of opportunity with management to give them a little bit more autonomy, a little bit more opportunity to fail or make decisions based on their individual contributors. Um, when you throw over the, the fence, hey, we want to meet this goal for Q, Q3 or Q4. So you mostly talked about supporting people with their work, which is very important. But what about toxic tr structures in companies? What about discrimination? How can you prevent that from happening? Or how can you tackle that when it happens? Are there any practices you can, uh, tried and test practices you can use to help people feel comfortable in this regard? Yeah, rethink your language, right? I think like, a, a, like it's one of our first steps there where we always question ourselves a lot of times. Like, um, Growing up and growing up with certain media, you adapt certain behavior where you think like this is totally normal to talk like this. Um, and this is like just starting like from the harsh stuff, right? Like we thinking that if you don't like something, you don't use certain adjectives that are super, like if you think about like pretty hurtful and like not saying, ah, oh, you know how I mean it, like, but just saying, yeah, but we have like a very, diverse language there are different ways how to say this maybe in a way better way and then like the next step is like do we actually 
have a culture where everyone has the feeling that they can say what they want to say? Is it like that we only listen to the charming people that are like good with words or are we giving those people a space who maybe need some, I don't know, like you need to put a, a microphone in front of them so they uh, their voice is amplitude. And um, like, I'm, I'm talking here, like just saying that like, as I said before, like we're not like the perfect studio when it comes to female representation or diverse representation, but this is what we already established. And then there's like step like in the German language, try to um, use different formulation that it's more inclusive. And um, I think I know it doesn't apply, I guess, to the most viewers here that this is one of the main topics right now in terms of politics and like a, even a whole um, vote basically thought about one of the subjects like that we changed the way how we talk in Germany um, but it does so much and like actually we had an intern uh, working for us and she actually called it out and said hey why can't we use like more female representation in our documentation instead of always saying like the player he starts the game no 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 and it's like yeah sure I never thought about this and um yeah, suddenly when you start doing this, you see how easy it is and how much it can do for those people whose turn it never was. Because I always have the feeling that some people are like so afraid that, that something's taken away from them. But man, like we have been like, uh, me including, like it has been our turn for centuries, ages. Like it's not too bad like to let the others like have it. Like it doesn't take away from us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, language can be a very important part because by using language, you show how you view the world and also certain people. And if you include these people in your world world view, they feel welcome or more welcome than they used to before. So that's a very important step, I think, in um, having a more diverse workforce and treating them properly. Trinidad, would you like to add to that? I, I truly believe that we have opportunities to call out. Like if you create a culture where people can call things out, it's, it's part of like, it has to be a part of the values. Let me back it up. So like if, you, if you're if you building a, a studio, building it, like what are your values? And within those values, I believe you can use your values to create a space where people can be open and honest, but with good intention. I know it's like hard to like, not all call outs are gonna be nice and fluffy and they're gonna warm your heart. It might be something that really hits home and you're like, oh, that hurts. And I don't know if their intention was right. You know, like that's just, that's just focusing on the wrong thing. I think, um, and I know that not all the feedback uh, feels like good feedback, but like it's feedback is not a dirty word. And um, it's definitely something that can be unpacked. And I think the biggest issue with like people actually feeling open to give feedback, the reason why our surveys get a lot of responses is because it's anonymous, right? Uh, but when you feel bold enough to tell someone your feedback or create a, an anonymous Slack channel or something where people can give feedback is um, you don't want to feel like you're going to be ostracized or reprimanded for speaking your opinions. And a lot of times in cultures, it's when people take feedback personally, so then it becomes a us against them thing versus trying to see the root of the feedback and find ways that it can help empower the company or better the company. And so I do think that creating spaces where people can give their feedback is important um, and constant feedback and creating a culture where feedback is is given freely without this repercussion or without this idea that I'm trying to attack you, um, I think is a great foundational value that should be a part of every company. Now let's talk about the worst case scenario real quick or not real quick because it's important. What if there's there's really toxic structures within a company? There are many people who feel comfortable harassing others or discriminating others. It happens in big companies. There are always people who are toxic or usually there are people who are toxic. How do you deal with these people and how do you help people who feel um, harassed by, by them or discriminated by them? What can you do to support these people? 
I will say that they're they have to be called out. Like there's there's no um so for example like microaggressions. Microaggressions they're, they're not at the level of of toxic that you're talking about, but they're toxic and creating a culture that you can call out microaggressions and 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 also explain to people that there's three different types of call outs. There's one where I directly call you out. There's one where I indirectly call you out, like through a channel, through an all hands, through, you know, some type of questionnaire. And then there's one where I don't call you out. I, I go I go to HR or I go to a lawyer or I go to and these are like extreme, right? But at each point, it's okay. Whatever you choose to decide for you is the best case scenario for you. And to to degrade that or make you feel like you're less than because you had to go a different route is not okay. So let's say if there's leaders that are toxic, I, I would say protect yourself at all cost. And I would say, and I know that, and this is the harder part is for a lot of people who are marginalized, they don't have the option, like like you, you mentioned earlier, Nina, like not to fail, right? And sometimes leaving a company or 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 walking away from a toxic situation feels like failure. And at the end of the day, I'm telling you, you need to take care of you first. And if that means you have to take, go to the doctor. I mean, I'm not giving people suggestions, but you know, going to the doctor, getting health, health, health. Like if it's toxic, it could create PTSD. It could create an internal struggle. So getting checked out, making sure that you have the right support around you. And if that means going to a physician and getting a note saying you need to take a break or you need to reevaluate while you're there, do whatever you got to do to take care of your health and your mental health. And and that's that's important. So I do think that calling out the toxic behavior is important. I think we're seeing a lot more people doing that at these bigger companies. Um, and I'm also, it's crazy, you're seeing... Uh, governments do it. It's at, it's past the point of actually people calling them out. Now the government's like, oh, we've heard all these cases. Nobody's calling out. We're going to do it. And so it's it, the tides are changing and it's not accepted um, as much as it used to be because it was homogenous, right? Like, so it was majority, the majority usually covered it up. And now that we're, we're growing and we're being more open, we have the ability to really call it out so that we can heal. We can, we can, it's not, Calling it out doesn't mean the whole ship sinks. You know, we can actually call it out and protect the people and also protect the company. The people work at the company because they love the company. So if you're calling something out, it's because you want the company to be a better place, not only for yourself, but for everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Don't, and don't let people like try to mess with your head. Like if you raise these stuff, like all these things, they will try to use certain arguments or like, hey, change the perspective and whatever, but like trust yourself. Um, and if you feel alone and if you feel attacked constantly, like it's 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 not like you accepting uh, shame or failure if you just say, okay, that's enough. I guess there are situations where you can try to fight these fights, these good fights, but if you don't have a support net, um, don't do this. Like, this is still just a job. Sounds stupid because we're all passionate about this and we love what we're doing. But mental health, especially in games, is something that we kind of like dismissed like a lot in the past. And um, like, you need to be able to work after the situation. And it isn't worth it. Like, if you like go out there damaged, of course, like damage can be healed. Um, but there's always like a scar that will remind you and that will trigger you maybe eventually later. Um, like, please don't like fight until your dying breath, so to say, and, or like at least we uh, evaluate like if it is worth it. It's like a toxic relationship sometimes. So you might be madly in love with someone who's not the right person for you. And it hurts to accept this because you think, oh, what was wrong with me? But um, again, like we're all growing like until the very last breath that we take. So it's totally fine if you made a really poor decision by choosing a certain position. And if no matter if you stay or if you leave a company, you need support. You both mentioned that. What can individuals, what can co-workers do if they observe toxic behavior? Like most of us, 
had the, had this at some point, observing someone being toxic in some way, maybe not the worst way, but uh, using language that's disc discriminatory or something. What can you do in such a situation? Are there any, uh, is there any advice you can give those people to tackle these problems to help others? I guess some of the things that are taught when it comes to um, you showing civil courage, uh, like people being harassed in the uh, train or whatever, like something that is said there is not like you don't need to jump kick that uh, evildoer into the face. But first things first, you need to sit down with that person that is being har har harassed and show them that, that you are there, that you try to give them a safe space again. And then you actually can decide, like, what can we do against this? How can we make sure that this isn't repeated over and over again? And there again, I guess, like everyone, especially in a privileged situation, that that is saying, "Oh, I have actually never experienced this." Please, uh, privilege, check yourself, and please check your viewpoint on things. And are you really sensible enough? Are you really like just dismissing the feelings of other people? And like, be. Uh, like a partner, like be, be, be someone uh, that you would love to have had as a friend when like maybe a bullying bully was chasing you or whatever, like be this kind of person, like be a superman, so to say. So someone who will always be there, like no matter what, and then like support the hell out of that person that has been har harassed. And it's really like, just looking like I worked in a company with 1,200 people and if I go back into some situations, like it was horrible, like how no one felt responsible. We're like, yeah, it's not my problem because I'm not having this discussion. But actually by ignoring this, you're really like, and this is like not trying to man manipulate you to feel bad, but actually like you're part of the problem. You're creating like an environment where it's okay to behave like this. And if you don't look out, you might adapt this behavior uh, because you see like, oh, monkey see monkey do like, this is how it's done. I will do it as well. There's no repercussions for this. So yeah. So from your personal experience, do you have any specific advice for people how to navigate these situations? Because it's really difficult. I mean, acknowledging that something goes wrong, that's part of, well, reflecting on your privilege. And it's an important first step, but we have to acknowledge, I think, that it's really difficult to uh, step into the situation and protect someone and maybe step up to a person who's above you in the hierarchy, right? So from your personal experience, what can you do in the situations to feel safe as well, right? And to protect the other person. Do you have any experience with that? Yeah, lose like all the fear that you have from your superiors. Like your superiors are depending on you. You, like every single employee oh. is super important in the studio. And people try to play with power and say, yeah, like if you cause a problem, then we just hire a new person because this is the games industry, this is Studio X, Y, we will find someone else. But actually like replacing someone is a lot of work, takes a lot of money. And those shitty persons normally look a lot into the money and um, not it's, it hurts them a lot. And there's always the spark in those situations. I guess like it's similar if you have, go to a family gathering or like hanging out with friends when there's someone like acting weird and you have this feeling like in your gut, like oh, this situation is about to turn ugly. Please use the spark and listen to this voice and by either calling someone out, hey, let's turn it down a notch. Or and this was even like the nice way to do that or like separate yourself or like that person that is affected right now and say, hey, I think... Like in, in a work situation, as an example, I would say, hey, this is totally getting out of hand. I guess this is not professional anymore. And this is something where people that are like this get uh, triggered pretty easily because they're all about like honor and self image and uh, how they see themselves. And if you say, oh, this is unprofessional, they're uh, taken off guard. And this is where you can actually grab them and say, okay, maybe we should talk about this like with someone from HR or let's talk just us three and I'm the moderator or whatever, but at least say something and not like be this person who's just like, oh, I go there later. But if you're not brave enough, not in the sense like, oh, you're weak, you're not brave enough. But if you don't have this power, because maybe you've been attacked in the past as well, at least go into the situation after that and be there for that person that has been harassed. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you so, so much for this advice. Uh, Trinidad, from your pro professional experience or personal experience as well, what would you recommend for these situations? I would recommend that uh, 
if you're an advocate or an ally that you stand like it's not easy your job could be like like at what point do you believe that this is something that is a part of your very soul of who you are your integrity like who you are as a person and what you stand for if you want to tote to that you are an advocate and an ally to people from different backgrounds uh, I truly believe that you do at some point have to call out the aggressor call out the people who are not who are not reflecting the values that's why I, I go back to the values of companies and of studios like there sometimes you can go through an employee handbook or you can go through the values and you can pinpoint certain areas where you can also just call out what's already been said like hey the company doesn't stand for this da 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 da, da. and just and be that person um because it takes a village it's not going to be like if i stand up for myself like and the whole group doesn't it's it's it it's the most ostracizing thing and you feel so small so uh, not heard and um, I'm probably going to be on my way out. You know, like you're going to lose talent that way. And if you really value your talent and the, what they bring to the table, you should set and and set some examples within the company that say microaggressions are not okay. Um, harassment is not okay. I mean, by the government, we're required to have some of these things. So you at least have that. But also, what are the definitions of those things? Do you need someone to come in and do a harassment training or do a microaggression training or do to, to educate people and, and give people that platform where they can feel open enough to call out someone in love? The one thing is, I know that when someone cares about me, when they call me out, I receive it even when it hurts. And I like to give an example of my mom. My mom always gives me the toughest feedback in the world, but I know it's coming from a place of love. I know she's saying the things that she's saying because she wants me to be a better person. And it didn't, I'm 39, and I promise you, it took me up into this 39th year of my life to actually realize that. Because for so long, I just thought, Mom, you just don't like my friends and you just don't, you know, like, ah, you know, like, I, I promise, I know, I know, I'm a human, right? Like, so just to be able to understand that, like, because my mother is coming to me with these things, she's coming from a place of love and care and respect. And she, she knows that I don't get this feedback from everybody. And so if you set the precedence within your teams from an early stage of, hey, we call out nonsense because we care, we call out when something is not landing well, because we want to help each other be better and we want to create an inclusive environment. It, it has to start somewhere and it's not going to be fun. These conversations and and, and, and um, questions that may be brought up are for the benefit of the long term of the business. And if you see it like that and you see it as the person who's coming towards you actually wants you to be a better human, I think it's a little bit easier to receive. But until then, it's it's very hard for people to rise up on behalf of others. We talk about the stop AAPI hate that's been happening. There's been a lot of AAPI hate in the US and even globally because of the pandemic, because of the coronavirus, and you see it. How are, how are you as a human, even in the streets, when we're dealing with like when someone coughs, like, you know, are you, are you looking at them like, oh, they're Asian, so they carry the virus? Like, if you are, you're wrong. You know, and so I'm just telling you that right now, you're wrong, and you need to check yourself. This is not a virus that was created by one single person, right? And it's like to pinpoint and focus and try to hate people because of that, that's just what society wants us to do to be divided. And like, guess what? If your system and your company and your people are divided, you're not creating good products because there's mostly infighting and they're like, how do we cut down the definition and the desire to create um, divides with between people and build up a solid community that can then fight the inequalities together, right? In love. And I know love coming out of my mouth all the time is not the best thing that you can ever think of, but guess what? Love matters. We talk about empathy a lot now. We need more leaders that are empathetic. And it's because we're people first. And so I truly believe that um, 
talking about bystander training, that's what it's called, bystander. You're a by, your ally, you're a bystander that's advocating on behalf of another bystander that you might not even know. So if we can do this in the in the in the highways, in the byways, in the marketplaces, on the on the, on the trains, on our public transportation, like you don't you you start in your everyday life and as you start to do it more every day for each other, it becomes easier. But we have to start somewhere. Mm-hmm. Now, looking at the clock, we're almost ready for Q&A. And now that we talked a lot about very difficult topics, I'd like to end this part on a positive note and ask you if you have any examples of companies that are doing many things right already, that are not toxic workplaces, but really good places to work at and to look up to and ask for advice. Maurice, do you want me to go first? Yeah, like I'm, because I was talking before so much, I already felt bad. <laughs> I, I do think that there are a lot of companies that are like, so just point blank period, nobody has a silver bullet and nobody's perfect. I do think that because people leave managers and not necessarily people leave companies, there are a lot of great companies out there. But when you get to become so big, you, you have managers that may not embody the values of the companies. And I've seen people leave companies um, because of bad managers and sad, like sad because they're like, but if I just had a different manager, I'd stay, you know? So so there are a lot of great companies that are implementing things that are innovative and new. And I can, you know, say in the game industry that I, I know some pretty dope diversity leaders that are, are doing great impact in companies, but it's going to take years to see it actually rise to the occasion. So I think at Niantic, we're doing dope things, of course, because I work here, but also we're working on manager training. We're working on like, how do we empower our managers? Because we have a lot of new managers that are coming up, up the ranks. And then we have a lot of older managers who are used to where they came from and how, where they came from did things. So there's a there's a new tide where we're trying to educate and education is needed in order for us to really change the game. That's why I talk about policy change, you know, making sure that you're not just doing the low hanging fruit of empowering ERGs and and, and saying that you have a, a DNI sourcer or, you know, like like I call that low hanging fruit because it's quick wins. The 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 long term wins are when we change policies, when we change performance reviews, when we change how people are paid, equal, you know, equitable pay for all people, all those different things matter, right? We know that women get paid less than men. That's a fact. Like we have a day every year globally where we talk about it. But if we know, why don't we just change it? It's so this is what I'm saying. There's some things that data doesn't help. People actually need to put their their hard-earned efforts and risk their their jobs and risk their their status to say nope here this is what we're gonna do so um, so I think Niantic's great I think Riot's great I think um, I think Act not Activision sorry Activision needs some help right now but there's <laughs> but um I mean considering everything that was oh, I can't believe that just came out of my mouth anyways you know there's there's a lot of places that need some help. But I do think that we also have some smaller studios that are on the brink of of cutting edge. And um, I know Brass Lion is in at, based out of New York. They're doing some dope things. They have a balanced team. I think that there's um, organizations like Black and Gaming, Latinx and Gaming, um, IGDA, IGDAF. There's Game Does of Color. There's I Make Diverse Games. There's um, um, there's one. Uh, Pock and play like there's all these different organizations that are rising up that are helping these studios be better because they're calling them out, but in love and they're saying, guess what? We can help you. We can help be a solution to the bigger issues. So um, I think it's not just where you go work, but it's also the communities that you align with that are going to help you be a better human in this space. And so some of those communities that I mentioned, I also mentioned women in games before, none of these communities are perfect, but they're there that we can tap into to find resources and to find people who might be willing to have the conversations, the tough conversations. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maurice. Yeah, and like, I can just say like from like, 
to represent Hamburg, so to say. Like I mentioned them before, but a studio, not because I also deeply in love with the people that work there, because they're almost all friends of mine. Like Crazy Bunch is a studio here in Hamburg that has like, I think a 50-50 split, male, female. And I know that like in terms of equal pay and like just looking back because like I was, um, able to write on the one Larry game they like they did too like looking at the process how it was handled because what it was a difficult subject like how do you do like floaty text how do you write female characters and like we role played the texts with the team and asked them for feedback and what is cool what is not and like everyone was super relaxed, like with calling stuff out that was not okay. And everyone was okay with being called out. So um, of course, like you can now all apply there at Crazy Bunch, but please apply at Tiny Law as well, because from like 30 um, CDs that I get, only like one or two are like female or like anything else. And it's like, yeah, please help us. <laughs> Okay, everyone, you just heard it. Apply to Tiny Raw. They're looking for you specifically. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. I just noticed that we have a question from the audience, which I'd like to forward to you. And that question reads, how can somebody, how can someone think about diversity when you live and work in a homogenous society? We also want to be inclusive and we try hard to have a diverse team. But at the end of the day, we have pressure, projects, deliverables, jobs to be done, roles to be filled, and we can't wait ages. So how do you respond to that? Well, let me take a stab at it first, because even the term ages shows that you're, you're I don't know who, who, thank you for that question, but whoever posed it has already a negative view that it's going to take forever. You've already cut yourself off at the knees by saying it's going to take ages guess what, it may not take ages. And when you live in a homogenous society, the thing is to understand what does underrepresented minority mean in that society. And you can look at a country like Japan, which is homogenous, but diversity in Japan would mean someone who's not a, a native speaking Japanese, someone who may be from a different region and is not considered a Japanese um, national. It may be taking people from, from other countries that are refugees or people who are in that space and creating opportunities for them to be within that organization. And I can't speak to Hamburg like that, but I'm pretty sure that y'all are, you know, have people from other countries that are coming into Germany. Germany is not just all Germans. Like the, I, I've been there before and I saw Africans. I saw people from different countries that are there. And I'm just like, okay, so how do you engage in people who may not be fluent in, in, in German, like, you know, like as their first language, but have been able to be successful and create a, a life and a home there. How do we tap in and create opportunities for people to know that the game industry is present and real? How do we give opportunities for people to understand that there's over 101 jobs in the game industry? So you could be a lawyer, you could be a marketer, you could be a finance person, and I could take someone from a different industry and bring them into the games industry. So I'm saying to this person, whoever you are, please, don't box yourself in and think that it's going to take forever to find a person who doesn't look like you but think about ways that you can think outside of the box and even look in your own community and see who you see walking down the street that you may not notice every day who could possibly have an opportunity in the industry and then i'll pass it over to maurice yeah so like i guess like I can sympathize with that question because it's a situation like where I would say, yeah, this is one of the reasons, I guess, why we uh, have mostly male employees. But at the same time, like what you were saying, uh, Trina, is that like, I guess, especially in Germany, we try at least, at, I would say like the progressive folks to not distinguish too much, like like who is German, right? Like if, because like there were in the past, a lot of people have been, confronted with or like or are still like confronted a lot with their background and this is also like it's a very difficult subject i guess like especially for uh cis white ceos or whatever like to how do i actually throw this topic into a ring and this is actually a question that i would ask uh, toward you towards you as well because like i 
I want to have like very diverse uh, cultural backgrounds and I already have people like who have like from Russia and, and, and wherever like ha have um, different influences, but they themselves identify as 100% German. So I don't want to put the spotlight on them. Like, hey, you look different and you speak a little bit different. Tell us more about like how much you are different, right? And this is like this balance um, where you try to be super inclusive and at the same time, yeah, it, 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 it's, it can be a, a, um, a difficult path sometimes to find the right words to not feel someone then special in the bad way. Yeah, so I don't know that if there's like a, a good uh, answer to this question, like how to tackle this. <laughs> well, maybe the person can respond again because we still have time. Also the rest of the audience, if you have any questions, we still have about 10 minutes for that. Um, okay, so the person said to Trinidad, when you're trying to hire someone for more than eight months, it's ages. How do you respond to that? <laughs> I hear you. And that can feel like ages. And so I, I have no rebuttal to that. That seems like a very long time. Um, but if you do want to reach out to me, we can talk about if you exhausted all of your resources in trying to find this one person and um, and go from there. Because not only am I someone who's going to challenge you, I'm willing to sit down and brainstorm and find ways to think outside the box because I don't think that um, we try, we've tried everything. I, and, and that could also be like looking at other industries. I mean, if you're looking for a senior role, then that's another story. But are you willing to look outside of the industry for senior leaders? Um, and that might not be your first thought process. Um, I also mentioned um, women in games, pock and play. Um, oh, there's also, uh, oh my gosh, I, I met them in, when I was in UK. Um, Yuki. There's also Yuki, which is out in the UK. And like these are networks where they're very diverse networks. And within those diverse networks, I believe they're connected. So it's like to be able to even reach out and say, hey, I, you know, I've been doing this for six months, four months, however long it's been. And I'm struggling with finding top talent. Can you help me find the top talent? That could be a partnership of a lifetime that could help you and your company continue to have a pipeline of talent. And then there's also... I try to think about like ways, like you talked about Maurice, that you have an intern. Internships are dope. Um, you also have to find ways of access for people who, who've never been in the in industry. Those internships, those apprenticeships, those things could also provide talent where they could tap into their communities and create even a bigger pool of a pipeline. So um, I hear you, eight months is ages, especially when you're recruiting. Uh, and if you wanna hit me up, we could talk about other opportunities and other ways to think outside the box to possibly recruiting. I'm pretty sure you probably hired that role already, but if you have more future roles and you want to create a plan, a recruiting plan that is outside of the box, let's talk. If I may jump into this and give some advice as well, uh, I would say keep networking always. Don't just look for diverse people when you're looking for someone to uh, fit into a position, but try to have as, as many diverse contacts as possible, not just because you want to work with them because they're also good to be around, good to uh, bounce ideas off. Always do that. When you're at a conference, for example, just talk to people. Don't sit next to the people you already know. Approach someone, to, someone talk to them. That helps a lot because personally, I've built up a huge network of diverse people over the course of the years. Whenever someone, someone uh, tries to find someone for a development position or maybe for an article or something, I usually can give them some names. So approach people, be open about uh, new ideas about them, and you'll soon have a network of people you can talk to. So that really helps, in my opinion, and in my experience. And I agree, so, I, because I, I, I'm guilty of that. Like, we didn't put enough effort, like, into the right channels. Like, we were, like, posting on the usual job boards or whatever. But, like, I didn't put the effort in, like, reaching out to you, Nina, or, like, even maybe I didn't even know you back then, like, from your articles or whatever. But, yeah, you can always do a little bit better. But it's hard. And, like, I guess a lot of things are, like, also, um, like, how, how, how can you uh, not only limit this to 
male, female diverse, or like how can you find even from different cultural backgrounds, like how do you tackle this? How do you put actually up a job posting for this? Because I don't know this, and this is like why I was so clueless with my uh, last thing that I said. Like I didn't ask the right people that I should ask, for example. So I also like taking away from me is like, hey, I really should speak to Trinidad next time, like before we hire someone because she might give me feedback on this. Yeah, people like Trinidad me, we are out there. And if you approach us, we're happy to help. So you just have to ask us. I mean, it's difficult to find the starting point to approach someone for the first time. But once you do that, and once you look for people, then you'll find them. There are, for example, also a lot of di uh, Discord communities, for example, the FemDev Meetup Discord community. And if you post a job offering there, you'll get responses. So you just have to find the right places to put your job offers and it's very likely that you'll find someone so keep an eye open and the problem shouldn't be as big anymore um, so we have another question why is the debate in hr not intersectional in the gaming industry i feel like talking about diversity in the industry it's all about hiring women without regarding able-bodied or bipoc topics so uh, yeah anyone wants to comment that i guess uh... It's, it's like this um, different battles that we're fighting still. And, and like, it's, it's uh, I, th I guess that there, I, I know no one who would say I wouldn't hire someone that is able-bodied or whatever. Um, it's, it's more about like, oh, we didn't think of this. And this is maybe going back to one uh, person that asked the question, like, because you're so busy with like, depending on your also like studio size, surviving for yourself that you keep some, uh, like, that, that you're not looking out for people who might need to be looked after, or, like, should, like, get a boost. And then this is something um, which is really hard sometimes, but we just need to get better. It needs to become more, more normal. And I guess, like, just this question is really good because um, this puts it back into my head again as well. Like, I didn't think too much about it because, yeah, I sucked in this topic. Mm -hmm. Brenda? I will say that um, when leaders think about diversity, equity, and inclusion globally, they usually think about women first because of all the different cultures and intersections between different places. Now, a forward-thinking leader will think, what does underrepresented minority mean in the culture that is presented or the, the place that is presented? So um, I, I, will, I, I can't say that I am one of those people who don't think about um, BIPOC. Like I, I actually think that diversity, equity, inclusion benefits um, women and gay white men more than anybody else. And that's a statement that a lot of people don't like to make, but people are going to go with what they're most comfortable with first. And, and fun fact is women and white men, no matter what you identify as, like as your, you know, as your source is comfortable. And until we get past being in comfortable places and thinking about people who will challenge us or like from fun fact, a lot of people of color, a lot of marginalized genders and ethnicities don't receive feedback. Why? Because it makes the manager uncomfortable to tell them something that they think either might scare them, make them mad, ruffle feathers, and that's the worst thing you can do. If you are a manager of someone who is of a marginalized gender and ethnicity, please give them feedback because in that feedback, you're telling them that you actually care about their growth and success. So going back to the question, it's we have to break free of the desire to stay complacent in comfort. Um, we have to break free from the ideas that nobody's out there. We have to break free from the, the idea around, oh, they're not qualified because they don't go to these schools or they're not qualified because they haven't been in the industry for this long. So. Um, I do think you brought up something that is very real 
and it's very prevalent. And I think that as we start to be, see more companies become global companies, we're gonna have to address that we really focus on underrepresented minority in the US and we don't focus on how that does, does that actualize and how does that become real in other cultures. And, and honestly, I do think it's a dance. It's a dance of educating other cultures, like let's let's say Germany. If if we if we have an opportunity in Germany to educate Germans on why it's important in the U.S. to talk about underrepresented minorities, but we also have an opportunity to educate the U.S. on why it's important to understand the culture of Germany. You know, like it's it's a dance, and and sometimes it's lopsided. And and to be honest, a lot of a lot of companies have been lopsided because of the demands in the U.S. and the in the laws in the U.S. versus in other countries. That's not that's not a, a demand because they're more homogenous. But that doesn't mean you forget about them. So I do believe that there's a lot of work to be done in this space. But I do think it's going to be done beyond just having one DEI, DEI leader, beyond just having one you know global head of you know without a team of people to focus in these other areas that are important so it's thank you for that question it's a great question so we have i think time for one more question i'm and i'm really glad that this came up because it's a very important question i think to answer and it says sorry to keep insisting on this but shouldn't it be about hiring the best professional available that fits our needs or should we wait and network until we find the best diverse candidate? So that's a question that comes up very often. How do you respond to that? I think it's very important to respond to that. Um, maybe I will just start. Um, I don't have the perfect answer for this, but this is something that came up within our studio as well, like with, our, like with this topic of why the, is there a quota for female employees? We should only hire the best people and if this person is by accident male or female or body able it doesn't matter um, but this is all about like um a, a lot of things like uh, i i just know it from my experience like i got my job uh, like my first game design job because i knew someone that worked at that company and they pushed me forward And this is a privilege because I knew this person. Why? Because in school I connected with someone and I made a good impression, blah, 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 and goes on and on like this. But a lot of people don't have this privilege to be seen in that sense. And like, um, also we have a culture like where, for example, uh, male uh, people will always try to like, I fake it until I make it. Like there were, way more like, haha, I will just do it, whatever. And I know a lot of self-critical uh, female friends who would never apply to a position where they don't feel like perfect, like hitting every single bullet point. And this is like a, a society problem. It's, it's not like something just for the games industry. It's like that we like always say, yeah, we're just looking for the best person for that position. And like, it's not our fault if that person is male. Actually, yeah we just put more uh, energy into a cycle that is repeating itself over and over by just putting like male people in power. And I guess if you still ask this question, um, just look at what happened at Activision Blizzard, uh, what happened there, because this is exactly what happened. They always got the cool talent and pushed that cool talent forward. And I totally know where the question comes from. Like. I can't wait forever to get this level designer. Like with our project right now, um, we needed to get it. We had only one month to find this level designer, which is insane, by the way. Um, but um, of course, you need to make some strategic decisions from time to time. But then you don't like um, you. You didn't solve the overall problem. You just solved the problem that you now have a level designer. Um, but it might have helped if you had like in my position, a female or body able or uh, whatever uh, uh, level designer that brought in a new perspective instead of like our very lovely uh, level designer, Eddie, um, who's an awesome person, but still like it could be someone who brings completely new uh, things to the table, even though they don't have that much experience. And you will only see this effect if you actually worked with people that weren't like the best for the position, but were maybe ones who fought even harder for this and faced way more obstacles in their life. And like a sheet of paper is a sheet of paper and like school degrees 
like especially in the games industry don't matter that much in my opinion it's just about like how you can see like what is the portfolio of the person and how uh well can they work together with others and um yeah sorry for the long rant no thank you <laughs> that was amazing and just to add to that i think something that you touched upon is what's going to be the best for the team in the in the sense of like you you think that hiring the top talent is the best for the team but what about hiring someone with more a difference of background where they're able to balance the team out call out the team they're able to do the job but they're also able to balance the team out because they've endured different experiences and have different experiences that can even level up the team in regard and i i think that that comment of aren't we supposed to hire like i hate when i hear it it sounds like a little kid going na 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 boo boo aren't we supposed to hire the best talent like duh like of course of course we're supposed to hire the best talent but we're also if you get a team full of everybody from MIT, are you really getting the perspectives that you need to build what you're trying to build? No, they all came out of the same place, all have the same perspective. You're essentially getting five of the same people just doing different jobs. You have to think of how am I going to build a team that can catch things that one person can't catch? Like if you think about um, partnerships that work, they're partnerships where they're balanced where one partner is focused on one aspect, the other partner is is where they're strong, they're weak, and the other person is where the person's weak, they're strong. It's, it's this ability to acknowledge that one, one gender, one ethnicity, one background is not gonna solve the whole world's problems. We live in a world that is so multifaceted and when we're able to step back and get beyond our pride and our arrogance, we're able to see that we don't know everything. And when we get to that place of being transparent and vulnerable, we can say, you know what? I'm willing to connect with people who don't look like me so that I can be better. I, I There's a, a CEO that I value a lot. And um, when, when I um, met them, they were like, I've surrounded myself with people who are better than me. And the reason why I love that is because recognizing your weaknesses is the first step to being able to build a stronger team and, and have success. And um, I know that my answers are not fun and frivolly and heartfelt. Like they're very heartfelt, but they're not fun and frivolly. But we got to start having these conversations. I don't care that the question was asked, but it's in the energy that the question was asked that I care about. Are you asking this question because you truly want to know a solution? Or are you asking this question to continue doing what you've been doing and just tell me I hired the best talent? I think that's something that people have to sit with. And maybe Thank you. Just to add on this, like for me, the big eye opener for this question was looking at this example of AI facial recognition, and it was developed by a team full of white people and they were super surprised after like developing it for several years and bringing it onto the market that it doesn't work for people uh, of color. Like, give me a break. Like this is the perfect example why hiring the perfect person on paper is not just like their credentials or whatever. It's actually also like to balance out the team. And I guess this is one of the biggest takeaways of this, what Trinidad is saying all the time, like we need more balance. And um, also, I totally agree, like the energy with how the question was asked, and it was like, yeah, check your privilege. And I don't mean this like in any harmful way, just like, actually this comes from a place of love. So somebody just shared another question, which I would like to quickly discuss. We don't have much time left, but it's a really good question. So let's use this one to wrap things up maybe. So the person, uh, writes, coming from other industries, I've noticed the real issue with ageism as well in games industry. The fact that this industry doesn't support stability and retention scares family oriented, retention scares family oriented people, often women, and does not welcome parents coming back. How do you think we can improve that? That's actually something I wanted to ask as well. So that's perfect. <laughs> parents back. It's like a simple thing. Like if someone takes his time off, 
to ta take care of his family, like let them go. And uh, like we need to like, these people are staying so much at work. It's almost becoming their second family. You spend so much time in the office. Like, why shouldn't you act towards them like a family member? Like if someone gets another kid and they want to take a six month break or whatever, like, of course, planning wise, it's not the best situation, but man, like as a CEO, it's your job to make it work and find the solution and not like choose the easy way out and say, nah, this, this human can get pregnant. This is a liability for my plans. Yeah. Actually, screw your plans. They're pretty shitty to me. <laughs> Trinidad, do you want to add to that? I do. I do. I do think that um, we have to recognize that we do a poor job of planning and scoping some of our games. And what I mean is nobody ever really knows how long it's going to take to develop a game. I mean, we can we could we could put like put it in the atmosphere and be like, yes, it's going to take a year. And we have to address crunch. Crunch happens because of poor planning. And when crunch happens, then we expect our parents and our and our mothers and our um the ones who are more established and may have bigger families to drop everything and get on board because it's crunch time and we need you now. This is the most important time. No, the most important time that we needed you was from day one when you started working on the product and realizing, okay, there's some there's some things that are slipping. You know, so where's the accountability to really creating? Um, Fun fact is I used to be a product manager. So when you want to talk about like life cycle of products, that's something that I, I, I lived with. I herded the cats and I know what it is. It's cats. You have cats everywhere doing these different things and you have to herd them. So I feel for product managers and I feel for people who are, who are scoping in the product. But at the same time, we have to do a better job of realizing that we have vacations, we have families, we have slips slips in, in, in our scopes and different things of that nature. And what are we going to do to plan for that? Can we put, put can we put that in the planning piece? And then also backfilling. If someone's going out, it may cost more money to hire someone else to fill their role. But when that you bring that person in to fill their role, but when they come back, you have a choice. Do you want to keep this person and keep both of them, or do you let them know this was a contract position? Thank you very much for your your assistance, and we're going to go back to the person who was here. You know, take a couple months to let them overlap so they can share information. But I do think it's imperative for us to make sure that we're planning correctly so that we're not doing so much crunch. We have to address the crunch culture that we've allowed. And that's because it's a bunch of single people who don't have lives and they are okay with being in the studio all the time. And we're moving away from that. The generation behind me wants balance, wants to take their vacation, wants to build families, wants to enjoy life traveling the world and do their job well. So let's, let's talk about that. Thank you so much. Time's up, unfortunately. I didn't get to ask half of my questions, I think. So maybe some other time, but I really enjoyed this discussion. Thank you so much, both of you. It was really insightful, uh, really helpful, I think. And uh, where can people find you again if they want to ask you a question maybe or get in touch to work together or something? I'm on Twitter. This is Trini and I'm on LinkedIn. I'm Trinidad Hermida. Yeah, and I'm like on Twitter as well. So you can add me at Maurice uh, underline, whatever it's called, Allah. I bet it's super hard to spell it. Maybe just go to the Game City side and you will see our old contact information there or go to the Game City Discord because it's awesome anyway. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, my name was Nina. I, I was your host for the evening. I really enjoyed the discussion. And now it's Johannes' t task to uh, kind of lead you out of to the evening, to the rest of the evening. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Um, really good discussion. I, I guess we could go on forever and it's uh, really, really insightful and interesting. A big thank you to you, Trinidad and Maurice, uh, for sharing your thoughts and your, your experiences. And um, very much thank you to Nina for moderating and for uh, giving impulses to this discussion. Um, and also thank you to everyone who was watching tonight and who contributed by uh, sharing thoughts and questions. Um, Did we lose Johannes? No, Johannes. 
<laughs> Johan. Or about us. Johan. <laughs> oh, I was, oh, I was lagging. Yeah, oh, yeah. no. But now you're back. <laughs> but it was probably like the most best thing that you ever said in your life. And we missed yes. That. No. Probably. <laughs> uh, I was just thanking everybody, thanking uh, all of our guests, Maurice, Trinidad, uh, and Nina as our moderator. I was thanking everyone who contributed with questions. And uh, I was leaving everyone to our Discord server. Um, visit our website, uh, gamecity-hamburg.de, to uh, find your way to our Discord. Also, I'd like to announce um, that we have another event of this series planned uh, on September 15. Uh, we have a guest speaker, Manuel Manhart, who is going to talk about gaming communities, diversity and positivity uh, in a talk titled Gaming Communities Competitive and Caring, uh, which will be very interested if you uh, want to join that talk too and the discussion around afterwards. Uh, feel free to sign up. It's online now on our uh, website, Game City minus hamburg.de slash events and um, thanks everyone again and have a nice evening bye thank you bye <laughs>